And so here comes the salmon, and FDA doesn't have anywhere to put it because Congress failed, and it's shoved into this Jerry Rig system, so they scratch their heads and go, okay, we'll call the salmon the drug. So the salmon now becomes a drug. And there's a few problems with that. One is under the new animal drug application, there is no, they've never done environmental testing because you don't have to use a test, you know, a drug. Like, you know, they, they don't have any ecological basis. And also it's confidential business information. Because it's a new drug, the entire thing is, is opaque. The, the, the entire process that has been with the GM of salmon, it is treated as confidential business information. So we have no idea what you're doing. Right? So that so but they're calling it a new animal drug. And of course, you know, we're gonna sue them on that, but um, it's almost not their fault. I hear EPA, this is great. Um, the pesticide organization. Now, the USDA handles all herbicide tolerant crops. 85% of all the crops out there, like you said earlier, are herbicide tolerant. It's the number one technology. But there's BT crops. People know what BT is? The Silicinogensis, it's a non chemical pesticide. They thought it would be brilliant if they put the BT toxin or genetic constructs of it into corn. Corn borer eats the corn, hopefully dies. Now it's turned out it didn't really work out that way because you can't really tell how much the corn borer is going to eat. So what we found over the years is the corn borer eats a little of it, gets the BT, doesn't die, and then what happens to the insect? It's essentially been vaccinated against BT, and that's what's going to happen. So that's failed too, and they've all adapted just like I said, natural selection before. But how does EPA under FIFRA, under the, you know, the, this? It's supposed to regulate pesticides. How is it going to regulate a BT plant? Well, it calls the plant a whole plant pesticide. Now, when they obviously passed FIFRA, they never thought that FIFRA would be dealing with an entire plant any more than they thought an animal bug with the entire salmon. So I just want to give you an idea of the, by the failure, uniquely among all of our trade partners, our complete failure of Congress to make any kind of mandatory testing, any kind of uh, changes to these laws that would fit this technology. Technology got shut down in these agencies to have these other tragic harmful effects. And much of my litigation, litigation of my organization, is you know based on the fact that you know these this regulatory tangle leads to tremendously inadequate regulation. And in some sense, I actually have some pity for the uh, agencies that we sue because they were given this job that Congress didn't do, and they had no no real tools to do it with. And then of course. What really happens is the corporations they know where the they know where the action is, right? Because there's no there's no loss. The corporations know, you know, I'm gonna go, I gotta get my people into EPA, FDA, USDA. And if you look on our site and several others, the the revolving door of people from Monsanto or DuPont coming into this is unbelievable. They run half these agencies during this time because they know this is where the action is, because there's no loss. If they can do a corporate coup d'etat of the agency, they got to make it. And the only thing that's standing in the way is litigation. That's, and I'll tell you a little bit, there's a solution to that that uh, just passed in Congress. All right, so um, here's a success list. I know you heard this on you, but this is all the stuff that we've been able to stop. Uh, most significant for me is wheat. And rice, and I should just point out alfalfa, and biopharmaceuticals are important. But I think the wheat would have been the thing that would have been most. When, when we beat Monsanto on the wheat, they had to fire 10% of both national and international staff. When we beat them on biopharmaceuticals, another 10%. This is a big deal. Keeping uh, um, the alfalfa off the market, we're right in court right now. It took, you know, we had to go to the Supreme Court to do it, but uh, it's about six and a half years. That's really important because alfalfa, no one uses herbicides in so this would be a completely new crop that would need this herbicide. Right now, about 7 to 17 percent of alfalfa has herbicide uh, treatment. Uh, this would, they're trying to ratchet it up to 90 to 100 percent. So this would be a, a, an absolute net gain for them, and a horrible loss for us as Roundup would uh, become much more. Uh, so this gives you also a percentage of the traits. You see up there. Talk about that. I think the most important thing about this is, you, and, and, and uh, Jim mentioned earlier, you see the 403 million accounts have since uh, 1997. That's a little misleading. If you look at the chart, uh, right now, because of the expansions and because they need more and more Roundup to kill these weeds as they become resistant, 
We're at about 115 to 120 million pounds a year, extra, this way in. So it, it'll be four, another 400 million pounds in, in, in two and a half years. So what they do is they often stack them together, right? So you have HD, BT, and HD, which is this, and then BT only. So this is the corn. Uh, top, uh, the corn, you can see the same thing. So they often stack their trades. So now they just made a deal with DuPont, Monsanto, so you can stack, so they're going to be resistant for a number of different herbicides. The, um, just quickly, one other thing, I think, before we go to the labeling issue. Um, they only have those two trades. Question: why? why? Why do they only have these two traits? BT and, and HD. That's about it, except a little pile of lighters. I mean, they were supposed to have nitrogen fixing, fixate plants, plants supposed to have greater yield, more nutrition under the vitamin A rice. Why do they only have HD and BT? Well, that's a good point. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the way they were going to make money. Uh, but both HD and BT are bacterial. They're bacterial genes, genetic constructs that they put in there. And they have a promoter, and they have a vector, and they have, have uh, antibiotic markers, so the DuPont goes into that cassette. But what they discovered was that the, the way that plant phenotypes work is not what they thought it was. Let me just give you a quick, quick thing on that. Do people here remember the Human Genome Project? Anybody remember that? Ten years ago, I ran out of genes we were supposed to have. 100,000 to 200,000 genes. We ended up having a little over 19,000 genes. Far fewer than we thought. Far fewer. And then they started doing the genome of plants. And um, they found that uh, corn, for example, has 35,000 genes. Um, Pinot Noir grape has 40,000 genes. Twice as much as we do. Now, it's a very complex grape. I love it. I don't know why. And it's more complex than several Republican members of Congress have been with. Still, it's quite an anomaly, 40,000 to 20,000. They just did the genome of wheat. Wheat has 80,000 genes. So if you were to take the genes of James Watson and Francis Crick, who discovered the structure, with the help of a woman named Rosalind Franklin, discovered the structure of DNA, and then you add Paul Berg and Norman Orlog, you still wouldn't have as many genes as in wheat. So four Nobel Prize winners, not as many as. So it turns out that the phenotype, the heredity, this idea that a gene carries a trait in Mendelian fashion is really late 19th century science. We now know that phenotypical changes in plants are extremely complicated, not only involving quotes genes, but all the DNA, including what used to be considered junk, numerous kinds of different kinds of RNA, and millions and millions and millions of epigenetic markers that change constantly with the environment, and a whole microbiome. These are all the, the living things, both in and outside the plant, in the root system, that fundamentally change it. So you have these millions of things working together dynamically. That is why they have not been able to genetically engineer a single phenotypic trait in a plant, and they won't. They're trying to iron in on that center, but they won't because it's too complicated. Far, far too complicated. Imagine you have 88 keys on the piano. We still, we're still not able to even figure out all the combinations of those 88 keys, much less when I sit down at the piano trying to figure out what, what I'm going to play because it's a dynamic relationship. So it's transcomplicated. So that's why they can do these easy things and why they have totally failed to do any major phenotypic change. And that's why it's the biggest failure and will be the biggest failure on agriculture because this is what they got and this is what they're going to have. Now they're going to try and Obviously, stretch the herbicide tolerance to 24D into that camera. I think BT is pretty much over. And uh, so it's going to just be just pretty much a herbicide pesticide uh, deal. Let's talk about, lab Let's talk about labeling uh, just briefly because I know it's going to be covered as well. Okay. So, um, label. The, uh, the FDA. 1992 decided that they were, they were not going to label genetically engineered crops, foods, I should say. Uh, this was done by a man named Michael Taylor. Michael Taylor uh, was Monsanto's lawyer at King and Spalding. Uh, he wrote the industry's 
version of what labeling should be, which is no, no, no mandatory labeling whatsoever, no mandatory testing, then evolved into the FDA, became the Assistant Commissioner for Food Policy, and that's 1992 under the Quail Competitors Council. They decided no mandatory testing or labeling. This is now policy in 1992. It's not even a regulation. It's a policy. We tried to litigate it in the late 90s, 1990s, but they said it's only a policy, so we, didn't, we haven't been able to finally litigate it yet. We currently have a petition in front of the FDA, which I wrote, uh, which has gotten over a million two five signatures with comments from people for labeling. And they're going to have to answer that eventually. They're not answering it yet. And when they do, they finally be able to, to litigate on that. By the way, Michael Taylor is back at the FDA, he's second in command. And uh, you're going to hear in about the next month that they're going to try and name him the czar, food czar, uh, at the White House. So Michael, and Michael is still with us. Uh, but what's happened with the absence of, of federal, uh, the, the failure of the federal legislation, the states have been going on their own, on uh, co-op with the California ballot initiative. Uh, we went out and spent $50 million for that $7 million, and we lost 51.5 or 48.5. There were some mistakes we made, uh, but it's still really, really close. And uh, I'm now work, uh, we're on the security committee uh, up in Washington State, where I think we have an excellent chance of winning another ballot initiative this November. And uh, meanwhile, we're in all these other states. I think uh, the ones that I would think of a shot are Vermont, Connecticut, possibly Maine. Uh, and what's going to happen is once one of those states goes, it's going to go to the feds, right? Because once one state goes, uh, and by the way, people at the Grocery Manufacturing Association of America and those folks, um, here's the ballot initiative we talked about. Um, the, the, the exciting one right now is the Washington one, as I said. It'll be this November. Please contribute to that. Oh, here's something really quickly on I don't know if my time was. One of the things that was really interesting, by the way, we won on election day in California. But um, I'm not sure if it's here. Um, oh, but yeah, even the people who voted against it. Oh, this is what I wanted to show you. You know, we often talk about the food movement as being, you know, upper middle class, white, you know, this kind of stuff. Take a look at these figures. This is these are the actual poll numbers from California. Take a look at Latinos, 61%. Asians, 61%. African Americans, 56%. Right? Take, take a look at this. It really is quite, quite remarkable that we got this enormous support. Uh, Democratic women, 60%, yes. College educated women, we lost. College educated white women, we lost by about 10 points because their advertising was specifically targeted to that audience. But look at, I mean, it's amazing how strong we remain. In those communities. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I was so enthusiastic when I saw that because it really shows how broad the movement's becoming. And I really believe with labeling uh, that it's not a matter of if, you know, it's simply a matter of when. And then the fight will go to Washington because then they're going to try and put some kind of compromise, and that could be very interesting. I'd love to more some questions. Thank you. Um, here's an opportunity in Mexico. We run a nonprofit called Cuatro Puertas, which means four doors. Blessings to the east, northwest, and south. And uh, we're a community economic development corporation. I'm a farmer, a beekeeper, a permaculturist. And one of, my, one of my main missions, missions here in New Mexico was to make an agriculture and economic revival sector. Because New Mexico has one of the largest informal economies in the United States. And basically, the way people have survived is by feeding themselves. And so, what we did is we decided to, in 2000, we started, in 2002 we were you know, a nonprofit, 
and we, our vision has always been to grow the farmer, although the Farm Bureau has not co-opted our slogan, but that was our slogan first, grow the farmer. So we had like my savings accounts to help them, you know, buy tools, equipment, whatever else they needed, then a loan fund, we still do, and also the state's largest collection of data that they seeds, brought to our seeds, and some of them from around the world. And actually we have some, some grains and things that do go to other places in the United States, so afterwards if you're interested, let me know. Because some of these seeds go elsewhere because if the climate is changing, we also have to keep these seeds moving to different places. So what happened was, I, uh, I'll talk about the Chile and New Mexico in a minute, but what happened was, as, as a result of the work we've been doing here, in 2008, we created the coalition called Save the Some Seeds Coalition. And I wasn't the founder, I was one of the co-founders with other, other people. And there are a lot of people over here, over, over 3,000 people that are involved with this, with this coalition here in New Mexico. It's religious groups, you know, farmers, beekeepers, ranchers, all kinds of people. And the Center for Food Safety has also helped us tremendously uh, when we were trying to, to, to uh, pass the farm protection bill. But what happened was, as a result of my work, I ended up being able to put this committee called AC21. So I think it was like the third or fourth time that they, they convened this, these, this group of people from across the United States. Most of them are, in, our, in my case, were all biotech. Out of 23 people, only six of us were non-biotech people. And several people had been on this committee from, from all of the, the different variations of the committee. Um, I didn't know anyone there when I first went there. And we were given this, this the task that Secretary Vilsack, who is the Secretary of Agriculture, this is what we're supposed to look at. The reason that was interesting for us <coughs> is because we're really concerned with the genetic engineering chili, that once it gets out there, it will contaminate our native chilies. And so this was really, you know, right in line with what we were trying to find here. So they gave us these three three tasks to do, and the first thing was is what type of composition mechanism that you would get contaminated would you know USDA create, and you know what would it look like, and then also the things that they thought you know we should be looking at. So one of the problems we had was that first of all the way they define different things. So we get there, and first right off the bat they said, okay, now you can only talk about crops like for contamination. You can only talk about crops that are deregulated. In other words, anything that's that's just been out in the test field that contaminates something, you can't talk about. Economic loss can only be something that we've gone through, through the court system. So if I'm planting here and Andy plants, you know, the Bayer rice, contaminates my rice, unless I file, unless I'm going to file the claim in the, in the court system, I can't claim that as an economic loss. So it was really, really difficult because, you know, if I get contaminated by a patented seed, I'm not going to report it because legally under the law, I could be sued for having this patented seed. And so that's why we kept you know, arguing with these, with these people that, with the USDA, not these people, <laughs> was that it was very difficult to, for us to gather data because we, we do know people that have been contaminated and we know some of the threshold levels of contamination, but you know, people aren't going to speak up. So one of the persons on the committee, uh, Ben Clarkson, he is one of the largest organic soy, corbeans, uh, commodity brokers. He did a whole analysis you know, of what it would cost him to test every truckload of soy and corn that went to his you know, facility. And then all the rejection, people that have been rejected. So every time the person gets rejected, they have to go dump that, call, that truckload of grain into the conventional market. But that's not documented anywhere, and also he, the guy is in his, his, um, his market. So it was, it was very frustrating. Uh, we went through different variations of what the draft should be, and the conversation mechanism, every, in the very beginning, the first meeting we went to, they had a guy from North Dakota, the agriculture commissioner, who's also an insurance person, already had a plan, an identification plan for how to do with the people who were contaminated. And then at the end, what we ended up with with crop insurance. Because what this really is about, all these genetic and genetic crops, is the, it's the commodity market. This is where all the money's being made. So for example, uh, you know, I don't know, it's kind of difficult to explain what it is, you, you, you trade, you know, like you buy corn futures, and um, a lot of these, uh, stock, you know, fund, like, you know, mutual fund, things like that. Some of them have like 60% invested in these commodities. And, and the reason they do is because the GE corn has a, a very set time. You know, you plant it, and it's many months, it's ready, and it's out of market. And so people can bet against them. And so that's what's happening, is that, is that you, they have to keep the commodity market going. So what was very interesting, too, is that now, Syngenta has created a corn 
or ethanol producer called Enogen. It's a self-processing plant. And what happens is one kernel in a thousand changes the composition of the flour or whatever you're making. So now all of a sudden the biotech uh, buyers like you know Kellogg's and all these bigger people, they're now concerned that their corn for eating might be contaminated by this ethanol corn. And so I think that was really the reason for this, for this bringing everyone together was to, to see like if they were to get contaminated, how would they be able to get their, their losses? Um, so at the very end, I was the only person that dissented on the final draft of this, of this, uh, this document. And if you go to, um, I have to get the website for you, but, but they came up with, with, a, with, a, with a, a plan to put in place right now. Right now they're going to do a draft like a, they call it a pilot project. So I'm not sure how it's going to be, you know, but they're going to do a pilot project to see like how much contamination there is, and you know, they're what they did was they get the biotechs uh, that if they were to buy this crop insurance contamination, that, that, that they put in borders more than what they normally have, that they would be able to get a discount. And that was kind of that's what the draft problem, draft the draft is right now. So I'm not sure what they're going to do at the end. So the way this goes into New Mexico is that skip some slides here. In New Mexico we have two issues really. There's alfalfa, because alfalfa is planted in every single county in New Mexico except Los Alamos. And alfalfa is a perennial, meaning that, that, that or the alfalfa is a perennial crop, meaning that you know you don't have to plant it every year. It's the first perennial genetic into your crop. This is why it's so dangerous. The other thing too we have in Mexico, we have water rights that go with the land. And so this is a huge concern to us because if someone becomes contaminated, then you know that person's water rights will also are at risk. So what happens in the southern part of the states like Grant, Sierra County, New Mexico, Luna, they do a lot of genetic engineering of cotton down there. And what's happened is that with all the glyphosate, they now have we have a, a, a weed called polar amaranth that has become resistant to glyphosate. And also all the chili, the industry chili is down there. Diana, and then Hidalgo County, and now Chavez County as well. So the red is when, when the GDL valve was in the market, before it was removed, that's the counties that had it. And in New Mexico, we used to have a lot of alfalfa seed breeders, and now all those are just about gone. And the little brown ones, the brown spot, the S, I mean, in 2007, that's what was still left, but I'm not sure all of those were just conventional seed breeding for alfalfa that might have been genetically in alfalfa. The chili, our native chili, is basically grown all along the Rio Grande. And the chili that's planted in the, in the bottom states is basically a chili that was developed for industry. So it tends to be very big, very thick wall, so it can be used for canning, or for roasting, processing. And because it's so big and watery, it's so big, it tastes very watery and also has a very mild taste. The native chilies up, up in northern Mexico, like from Sierra County on up, so Corona, or what's called Amory's Mines. So these are chili seeds that have been saved for like over 500 years. And so what happens is people plant the seeds, you know, they save some, share it with their neighbors, they plant them again over and over again. So the thing is the seed is, the static, is not static. The seed is always living. Even if you have seeds, seeds are stored, you know, for 20 years, whatever, depending on what crop it is, those seeds are still alive. So for example, we have corn from 19, before 1993. We have nowhere in the United States to plant this corn because you know, we know that before 1993 the corn is clean. So now, with being on this committee, I asked some people, well, where can they have this corn planted? And they said, Austria. That's the only place in the world now that we can ever go to plant this corn, which is kind of crazy, you know? So, the, the, the genetically chili that the, the, that the Mexico Chili Association wants to create is supposed to be something that can be uh, used for mechanical harvesting. Right now, they can do harvesting at red chili because they have these electronic lines in the harvester. As it goes along, it can pick the red chili. But the green chili is more difficult because they, you, know, you have the weeds to compete with, and they have all the green weeds. And because of the palmer amaranth that's resistant to Yanda, they were wanted to be around a consistent crop, but of course, that's not going to work for them. So now, the other thing they're looking at is uh, they have nigh problems with salinity, you know, salt in the soil, and they have phytophthora resistance, I mean, phytophthora problems fungus in the soil. What's happened is that if you talk to a farmer that has good farming practices, that rotates their crops, that doesn't use fungicides or pesticides, or, 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 or you know, artificial fertilizers, no one has a promise in the soil. 
But because these farmers, they rotate like alfalfa or the cotton, whatever they use, and all those different chemicals on the soil, the soils are basically dead. And so there's like a huge pop up on top of it. And what's happened is it's kind of, it's mutated. So in one field, instead of having one type of metopra, it's mutated up to 10 different varieties of metopra. So I don't know how in the world they can, they can solve the problem. It's mutated into all these different types. So our native chilies are drought resistant, naturally, pesticide resistant, drought tolerant resistant, and phytophora resistant. And so now what they're going to do is take the genes from our chili and put it into this genetic engineered chili. So this year, in, 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 uh, last year in October, we had a meeting with just a couple of people of us who were invited. Last year we were at this meeting. And it was with all these biotech people. Monsanto was there, DuPont was there. And I didn't know until last week, until last told me that behind us were all the attorneys from these companies. And so at this meeting, they did say that they were taking over 50 some varieties of our chilies that we could use for their research. Whose chili is it? Is it mine? Is it Les's? Is it Robin's? Whose chili is it? Are they going to patent the traits in this chili? So in 2011, so in 2008, we formed a coalition and we tried to decide what to do first in New Mexico. So the thing we decided to do was to try to pass a farmer liability bill, Farm Protection Act. So that if I was to get contaminated, I couldn't be sued. And so we tried for three years to pass this bill. In 2011 was the last time we introduced it. Um, and we made it to the House of work very good time. And it was a tie vote. And then it got heard six days later, and we lost six votes. But they really scared the industry. So what happened at this meeting in October, I had to step out for an hour and a half. When I came back, they had gotten Representative Bandy, who was one of our main supporters, to not introduce the bill this year. So meanwhile, what they did was they introduced a bill on labeling of chili. They fought the, the, the labeling bill here in Mexico, but they introduced their own labeling bill. What happened in 2011, they introduced the bill to label chili called New Mexico. But now this was called Expanding the Violations of the Mexico Chili Advertising Act. So now what they want to get us to do is that if you, if you not only call your chili New Mexico, but if you call your chili with a name to give any geographic area in New Mexico, like the Rio Grande, the Sandia, any Pueblo, any tribe, any town, then you have to be registered with the Department of your name goes on a public website, and you have to um, have a form that goes with, your, with, with you with each cell of chili that you have. I mean, this was created in New Mexico. We have New Mexico State University. The New Mexico Department Act is under New Mexico State University. The rules for this law were promulgated by New Mexico State University and the New Mexico Chili Association. It was created by New Mexico State University to do the lobbying for the research. So by us having to register with the Department of Ag, they basically have a map of where all our chilies planted, and whose chili, how much, and it's, it's data mining. I mean, to me, it's market collusion because now the chili association, that's our competition, and you know, in some ways, it's, it's you know, we'll have everybody else's information. Um, so we are going to protest. <laughs> I think we probably got, got signed. And just you know, the thing is that it's kind of ridiculous because you know, in some ways, they're making us give up our regional identity. So if I have this little bit chili. Chimayo chili, I cannot call that call that chili by the rice but by its cultural name. And the way too it's going to erase, you know, like people developing new, new types of chilies and calling it, you know, Dixon or you know, or South Valley or Valley. And so I think I'll stop here and then we'll get to some questions. Thank you. We're consumer advocacy group. Uh, I know Amy doesn't like to be a consumer, but we were one of Ralph Nagers' original public citizen groups. 2005, we got bigger, 12 people, now we're 75, and work in uh, North and South America and Europe. <clears throat> so uh, I am the organizer here in New Mexico. I am locally known as the neighborhood troublemaker. Uh, so we do one aspect of this fight against the giant, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, I have to tell you that I come into this work through um, political organizing. So a few years back, in the advent of uh, social media, all the people like me got together, uh, people who kind of try to get people elected. So they said, we need a plan. So let's let's go and make one. So they went behind closed doors and, and thought and thought really hard, wrote a really big plan. And weeks later, they came, they came out and said, We've got the plan on how to get people elected. It works everywhere 
in the United States, but one place, New Mexico. So that just gives you a little idea of what we have to deal with here in New Mexico. Uh, we are unique, as I think you may have surmised, many of you are from New Mexico. So what we did here, and I'm going to pick up a little where Isara left off, because uh, she has been involved more historically. Uh, we've been working here in New Mexico for about four years, and we're also working in Washington State and Connecticut to further the labeling effort. So we were the we first ones out of the box after Proposition, Proposition 36. Is that it? Okay, how's this? Okay, so we, were, um, we pre filed our bill, Senate Bill 18. This was not a ballot initiative. This is a, an amendment to the New Mexico Food Act. So we had to give some things away, and the New Mexico Food Act does exclude dairy, so dairy was not included. We made some decisions. We started this effort about eight or nine months prior to the legislative session, and here in New Mexico, we can only introduce bills every other year. Uh, we are one of the few states in, in the United States that does not have a paid legislature. There are some advantages to that, some disadvantages. Uh, so in off years, the uh, governor sets the agenda. So, uh, so 2013, we did find an incredible sponsor, Senator Peter Worth, uh, Democrat from Santa Fe, who introduced this amendment, uh, which uh, the New Mexico Food Act already requires labeling of certain things like sugar, like salt, like calories. So we said, look, let's just put another label on to tell us whether it's GMO or not. So the bill was pre-filed in December. Uh, we tried to do it stealth because uh, the minute Monsanto found out, which was about 15 minutes after we sent out our press release, I got phone calls from the newspaper in St. Louis, which is Monsanto's home city. So we got a lot of national and international attention for this, and, and little did our senator know that he was going to be kind of catapulted into the national scene, did interviews for papers and TV, radio, all over the country. So the, we work, what our model is, is we bring constituent pressure toward elected officials, and I'm happy to have some of my members here. Uh, so what we do is instead of my going in to uh, a senator saying, hi, I live in your district, I want you to label genetically engineered foods, I go in with 10,000 petition signatures, 60 coalition members and say, look, senator, you work for us. You need to do what we want or we will vote you out. So this is our model. We've been very successful with it and it's somewhat long-term, but nevertheless, the message is pretty clear. Uh, so, we had a wonderful uh, sponsor. We did uh, have the hearing in front of public affairs. We made decisions so that it was purely labeling, and so the bill never went in front of any ag committees, which we thought was instant death. So, it, we thought this is the, is the beginning to address this situation here. And it is a long-term strategy, so we did a tremendous amount of education. Uh, bill passed through public affairs, and uh, we know there was heavy lobbying going on. During that night, <coughs> uh, there was a lot of conversation about how successful we were in public affairs committee. The following morning, there was an unprecedented action on the Senate floor that uh, they automatically kind of bring all of the committee reports in front of the Senate saying, um, do you vote to accept these committee reports? In an unprecedented action in the Senate, as, as far as I've heard, it has never been voted to reject a committee report. However, that's what happened, and that technically killed our bill. So uh, it caused a, a huge amount of uproar in the Senate. We had a, a, not, a, not a very great governor, in my opinion. Uh, we do have a majority in the, in the Senate and the House. So that was a fast and furious campaign. It accomplished a tremendous amount of what we as an organization and I believe uh, other organizations throughout the country wanted to accomplish. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, our amendment was written before Center for Food Safety came out with their wonderful new model, but we did model our bill after Washington State, which is now also coming up front, and 
Um, and we feel has a really good chance, as Andy was saying, Food and Water Watch is very active in Washington and Connecticut as well. So I, this is a great segue into, I think, what are some of the solutions. Uh, I would like to encourage you to get involved locally with your uh, legislators. We did then, after the demise of the bill, go forward in the city of Santa Fe and pass a local resolution which was passed unanimously to support labeling of GMOs, GE foods. And that is going further in the county of Santa Fe to create a GMO-free planting zone. So that is the, our next our next step in Santa Fe. We also have an initiative here in Albuquerque, and here's one of our, our prime leaders in that, Karen. Uh, thanks for coming, and she is going to be heading up a group that is going to get uh, another resolution similar to that for supporting the labeling uh, of GE foods. Now, the resolutions are not enforceable, but collectively, if we continue to in this grassroots method, then when I go back to the Senate uh, or the House in 2015 and say, look, we have 15 different communities in the state, we have a coalition, uh, a huge coalition, also headed up by one of our greatest coalition partners, Levante Mutual Food Co op. Uh, they've been so instrumental in bringing this forward, and I, I really appreciate their support. So, this is the way we work. Uh, I, this is one little aspect of the whole bigger picture. Um, I love it, it's fun, and I encourage all of you to get involved in this, and you can do something, and you can multiply your vote by 5,000% by getting your neighbor, your, your teacher, your minister, your church group to sign on to a coalition letter, which we then take, as I am a registered lobbyist, we take with us and say, look, we have numbers behind us because one person is small, but together we are huge. And there are more of us than there are. I am nose to nose with the Monsanto lobbyists, and I want to tell you, they're slimy. <laughs> and they are ruthless, and they do their work behind closed doors. We don't do anything legal. We don't uh, encourage you to lay down in front of the delivery trucks or anything like that. We don't want to have to bail you out of jail. Uh, although, I, I know all this has happened. I grew up in the 60s. Uh, you know, we burnt our bras and our draft cards. But we're, we're doing this a little, a little bit more civilized. Uh, we have, uh, as well as the, the cause, we have beekeepers. We have organic farmers, organic gardeners. We have mothers, parent groups. Uh, this is an issue that is bipartisan. It is something that the whole community can get behind. And it is so easy to get involved. If everybody does one thing, we can make this happen. And there is going to be a tipping point, right, Andy? We are going to get this done. This is something that we deserve. And our campaign was, let me decide. If you want to make it, you want to market it, fine. Label it so that we know what we're buying that we are not feeding our children whatever it is you've created in your chemical industry. So in New Mexico, we are rolling out um, uh, a two-year program. We would, are going to be bringing this issue and another issue that we work on heavily here, and that's fracking, which also impacts the food industry. We will be taking this to interim committee, and we will also be visiting and lobbying with legislators in their districts. So I, I'm, I'm good here, and I, www.foodandwaterwatch.org, and we have a table out here. If you would sign our petition, we'll get in touch with you. Um, and this is what we can do in New Mexico and other communities to move forward. So it's really an honor to be here on this panel, and. Um, Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask our panelists to come back up front. And I just want to encourage discussion, brainstorming, um, strategies, where we want to go from here as New Mexicans, how we can really impact what's happening here in New Mexico, and 
also around the country and fit into the sort of the national strategy. So, uh, who has a question, a comment, a strategy, a brainstorm? Don't be shy. Yes. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is uh, Paul Powers. I'm the organizing and media director at Pesticide Action Network in California. Uh, and got to work on Prop 37 with a lot of folks at Center for Food Safety and Food and Water Watch, which is a fun, late one fight there. Um, it's so exciting to see the work happening in Mexico. Um, and I guess my question maybe is to Sauda and Andy in particular, speaking at sort of this high federal level. When you think about the sort of the types of changes we need to see um, in terms of sort of these larger federal reforms, do you think it's it's a bit of needing to update and modernize sort of these the existing laws and the capacities of the existing agencies, or is it a, a new agency that needs to be in place? What, what sort of is it fixing the existing laws, or is it a so you sort of touch on it's not working right now, but what's the what's the ultimate fix if we're headed there? It seems like labeling is a sort of baby step there, and it seems like you know, at least that's my perspective. Um, and so, what's the ultimate fundamental federal reform that gets us to where we want to be? I know this vision is perhaps a little ways off, um, but how do we actually get there? What's this larger federal reform look like? Maybe Well, um, well, first of all, labeling is important. Uh, the reason for labeling is not just the right to know, uh, but also it's the only way we're going to be able to trace health effects. And, you know, without labeling, health professionals have no way to know whether that, you know, if your child has a, a toxic reaction to sodium, if it's not labeled, they don't know. So one of the reasons is the, 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 they oppose it so much is that it would let people really see the health effects these are having. Uh, there's another issue that they have with labeling, which is that for 30 years and untold billions of dollars in public and private research, the industry has yet to come up with a single trait that would actually be benefit to the general public. There's no better taste, less nutrition, um, or, you know, sorry, more nutrition, better taste, longer shelf life, nothing. All they've done is, we keep talking about, it, they made it easier to spray your herbicides. Uh, and so, no sane person in the supermarket looking at a GMO label and a person non GMO would ever pick the GMO. It would offer some absolutely no benefit, it's not like this. So the fact of the matter is they have a product which is born to fail in the marketplace. And that is what they don't want to have people do. So that's why labeling will destroy the industry, not because people are hysterical or people are crazy, it's because they have failed as a, a, a as an industry to provide people with anything that would be beneficial or only provides risk. It's just a failure in the market. So that, that's why labeling really is important. Uh, the real problem we have in Washington and so many other places is that we don't really live in a democracy, in my view. Having spent 25 years in Washington, D.C., we live in a corporate oligarchy. Uh, and uh, so it's very, very difficult to change these things by this industry pressure. Um, I do think, uh, yeah, ideally, uh, you are going to need a, uh, a number of changes in fundamental legislation to make this happen. I would also point out that, um, which was prime again, as I mentioned in the 80s, uh, we now have something called the Food and Drug Administration, right? It's never been run by a food person. It's always been run by a drug person. Vicky Hamburg right now is, we, it is ridiculous. Why do we have food and drug? What's that about? Why don't we have a food agency? It's not important enough. You know, most of us don't eat. I mean, it's ridiculous. We should have a food agency that's run, you know, and, 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 and principally this legislation would fall under that food agency. Uh, Rosie Delora out of Connecticut has tried this year after year. Uh, it's been resisted by the big food people, of course, because they like it to be the secondary thing at the FDA. You know, they can always manipulate. So we should definitely have you know, a food agency in that. Uh, by the way, speaking of the national thing, I mentioned the labeling petition, which is by the FDA. It's got a million, you can still get on a uh, number of websites. Uh, again, Center for Food Safety website, you can, uh, which is just centerforfoodsafety.org. Uh, you can, um, uh, you get on Food Water Watch, Organic Consumer Association, whatever your favorite is, uh, and you can directly comment to the FDA. Uh, originally, also with the GMO salmon, that docket is still open. They extended it 60 days. I don't think they did it for us. I think they're confused about what to do with that salmon, which is never going to see the light of day. I have some legal issues with it that, that, that I believe it's, I don't think it's going to survive. But there's a million people who have already commented on that. So please, if you haven't gone, uh, get against the Food Safety website, uh, this brand new website actually, Discovery, renovated. Or any other website of the groups that you like and comment on that. 
add your voice to the CPL assignments, that does make a difference. So kind of the federal and the state operations of that. Are they being seen, just for example? I mean, if you don't have clean seed, the seed is it's clean, no contamination. We have, we have what's called seed stock. So if your seed stock gets contaminated, there's no way for you to get out of it. I mean, they say there's a way to get it out, but at this meeting in, in Washington, D.C., all the biotechs are asking this money to do more research to figure out how they can make their, their seeds sterile, basically. So, you know, that was one of the things that we've been the main concern here. Split back. So what we did is we joined a lawsuit, National Lawsuit called Estrada versus Monsanto. It's uh, you can go to PubPat, pubpat.org, and you can read about the lawsuit. So in March 2011 is when the lawsuit was launched, and basically it's to uh, it to, to to make it so that they cannot have the seed, you know, because once you have a, a living organism and they cannot control it. They contaminate the big one. Then we have no way to really grow our own food. And if our seed gets contaminated, you know, they have all this like can do research. Right? And you can do research on their products because, you know, it's patented it's, and they don't give you permission to do that. So again, it's very difficult to prove, you know, for seeds there's any patterns or anything that's that's, that's wrong. Uh, you know, they can that can damage us. So for example here in Mexico too, I mean last just last week I had a, a race race course person. They were feeding their uh, horses, alfalfa from Napi. Napi is a Navajo agriculture products, and the horses were getting sick. And then they finally went back and changed back to the old, old alfalfa, and it was fine because that one's generated from alfalfa, and it, it made a difference in the horses. Um, so I think once a year, like we've seen, I mean, it's really hard to change federal law. And I think I think locally, you start doing small steps like you know, yes, the labeling would be very important. But here in Mexico too, I mean, for us, it, you know. We, we have some people in the group, same, same, it's, we have a website too, it's safenfc.org. Um, it's temporary, not doing anything right now because, like uh, Donna was saying, I mean, this, this session, the legislatures and lobbyists, Monsanto and all of them were very, very nasty. They had our email accounts, um, you know, I got really bullied and harassed at the legislature this year. Uh, and we had had some farmers that were threatened in 2011 because they supported the farmer protection group. And so we were very careful. When we saw that things were really nasty, we kind of just stopped everything as far as like sending people notices about what was happening because we wanted to make sure we people were protected. So I mean, it, it is, it's a lot of money. And this is the first year I could and I really felt the money. You know, I, I felt it, I explained it, it was there. And so I think little steps you can do now before we get the labeling bill is that, you know, not, not to buy some of these products, you know, or support these companies. Know? Because your dollar is your power right now. Your dollar is your power, and also like voting in, voting in new people. You know, we really need to vote in people that really support our values and look at us. Yeah, just quickly, six states have passed farmer protection, uh, so it's not, not that it can't be done. And there's California vote. California vote to vote is out to go to Indiana. They, you know, we've been able to get six, which means if you're contaminated, uh, they can't sue you. So it's, it's sort of called the Persian Smizer, which is an interesting thing. Yeah, and I think with, with patenting, uh, you know, uh, what happened in 1980, they allowed the patenting of genetic engineered microbe, you know, the Chakrabarty case, so the microbe that could eat oil, but apparently it ate a lot of other stuff in desserts, so it was never really used. But the 19, and this is during the Reagan administration, 1985, they said, well, if you can patent a genetic engineered microbe, this is just the patent office, not, this is the Supreme Court, this is not Congress that said that you can patent genetic engineering your plants. In the 1987, they said if you can patent it's just a patent office, you can patent genetic engineering plants, plants, you can patent genetic engineering animals and genes themselves. And this was never passed by Congress. This is just the, the Reagan patent office sort of opening up. And uh, at this point, we challenged the Supreme Court in 2002, the Jane Supply case, uh, where the Supreme Court had a uh, decision written by Clarence Thomas was a former lawyer for Monsanto. He wrote that he did not recuse himself. He wrote the majority of saying, yes, you can patent plants. Uh, we were just in the Supreme Court a month ago with Hugh Bowman's case. Hugh Bowman is a farmer who said, after I buy it, after I buy it, okay, you can patent it. But after a, a, one season, those seeds that are mine, because you, didn't, you can't patent the offspring. You can only patent the original, so we'll see. 
the argument didn't go that well, but we'll see. And then the Marriott case, which is happening in the so-called breast cancer team, has been for April 15th. So at the end of the session in June, we'll know whether you can patent plants or patent genes. The Supreme Court you know, will say that. I also want to give a hands up to you. You were the only person in AC21 who descended from this idea of coexistence. And I really want to applaud you for that. Um, organic value, uh, I think trade association. Not only the trade, but we did. And this guy here at Bill Sank says he believes in coexistence. That's his idea. I mean, coexistence, I mean, we have contamination of NECBAS 17 miles. That's just the first level of contamination. How can you coexist with crops that have that level of contamination? How you can't have a buffer zone. So coexistence really means accept contamination and to that, you know, you know, this would just take over. And you were the only person on that. And they did some dissent, but they did not dissent from the, the, the concept that you're in your dissent was going on. Give your props for that, it was really great. Yeah, and then kind of like, that was the main thing that was coexistence was the main focus of that of the AC Twenty committee. So in an also I forgot to mention too that um, Dan Ravich, who's also the, the attorney for the Miriam King's one. So what happened is that we did, we had our, our first lawsuit was the first hearing was in December of last year, so no, 2011. And so then uh, we had to appeal the case, no, January 2011. And then we had the appeal hearing this year in January. And so we're still waiting to hear back from now. But one thing that was interesting was it was um, it was a federal court in D.C. Circuit court in D.C. And there were three judges on this panel, and there is a recording of the hearing, so it's really good to to, to have access to. It. But in this hearing, you know, one of the judges said, okay, you have to respond to attorneys. Okay, so I plant corn. I get contaminated by the generation of corn. Well, Monsanto sued me. And then they kept going round and round and round. And they would never say anything. And finally said, well, if you plant, you know, if you use Roundup, you know. But it's really interesting to listen to that transcript because you can see the frustration in the judge because now the judge felt like how we felt, like, you know, if I get contaminated, are you going to sue me? And Monsanto attorneys would never respond. Just a quick note, our Department of Ag uh, head, uh, New Mexico Department of Ag, also says that we need to uh, coexist here. So that's a fight that's really local as well as national. Right? That's, the, that's the word that's going out. Right? So we have that fight. So I saw him and someone, Michael and then Paula, and then young man back there. So Michael? Yes, uh, maybe food production is too important to be in the hands of organizations. Maybe we need to, uh, just like healthcare, get the uh, profit tiers out of the business and uh, maybe we need to grow food publicly. And I'm just saying that uh, from what I've seen, capitalism is failing. The, uh, 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 what do you want to call it? Private enterprise, I don't think it's working. Perhaps. So, okay. so, so did everybody yeah. hear that? About food that? is too important to let it just be run by the profit money. Because we all have to be consumers for that. Paula? Um, I just want to ask a question. Um, you know, in terms of what strategies succeed and fail, like why did we why did you succeed in wheat but not soy? And why do you think you'll succeed in salmon? I completely agree with this comment over here. Um, that, you know, we waste about fifty percent of our food. Uh, because you know, you're ridiculous, you have a supermarket and one right across the street and one down. This is the wealthy neighborhoods. Of course, in the areas that we were talking about earlier, there's no supermarkets at all. You have to buy your food in some, you know, bodega where we, we have unhealthy food at high prices, higher than organic, that you mentioned earlier. It's um, almost in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah so the, New the, the Mexico food is deserts, and yeah, we've been a huge amount of money for very unhealthy food. That should have been added to that, you know, to the wonderful presentation, you know, this morning. Uh, if you treat it as a commodity, it's, that's inevitable. You can't do it. It's everything commodity. And then they turn it into commodities so that, the vast, as I was saying earlier, 75% of our crops are commodities, not food. So they're just feeding our cars right now. Um, the, um, he, here's an a, a easy way to figure out how you're going to win or lose on these things. Okay? If there's an export market, you have a great shot of winning. Because the wheat and the rice, those, the, the, you know, the vast majority of the big ag people, they don't care whether it's genetic engineering or not. They're not those five companies that make it. Cargo doesn't care. The uh, Grocery Manufacturing Association, they don't make a dollar on genetic engineering. So they actually, they were, the uh, Grocery Manufacturing Association supported us completely against biopharmaceuticals because they didn't want Kellogg's corn flakes to be contaminated with you know, big things. 
Uh, so you can get some of the big guys on your side if there's an export market or a peer to the industry. When it's, when it's a local, more local like Alfalfa, it's much more difficult uh, because they don't, they're not afraid of the export market. You want, you want to have some of the big guys on your side. Uh, so you know, we almost always won when there's an export market. The reason that corn and soy and cotton got through was because no one at the time, uh, my organization wasn't big enough and we were engaged in other things that no one litigated at that time. It's as simple as that. Uh, with, with the, you know, and that's pretty much why the big four are still there, maybe some sugar bees, is because we've been able to stop every one of them, first or second one of defense, whether it be the litigation or market strategies. But no one was there, they got the first ones through. And now you can't sue them in retrospect, though we're looking at various ways to do that. The reason the GMO salmon, I can't disclose this completely, but the reason we're going on to GMO salmon is that we have evidence, very completely backed up evidence, that FDA has been lying about the salmon and has not been telling absolutely critical information that they had that they hid from the public and it's recently become available to us. And when that comes out, I think the salmon. Thank God, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go. Yeah, it does seem like a phenotype uh, change, not necessarily what I would consider positive, but, um, but certainly a success in that regard. Um, at least that's what I'd be like to see. Is that not true, or um, am I misunderstanding some of the science? Uh, that's my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, you're talking about, about flounder genes and tomatoes, there's a patent on uh, flounder genes. What they did is they tried to take the antifreeze, so-called genes, they could make flounder able to survive in very, very cold conditions, and put it into tomatoes so that frozen tomatoes would not deteriorate. Um, and uh, that looked like that patent gave us a lot of fun ammunition, some really great graphics. You know, the fish tomatoes on the book, you're right to know that we wrote together. It, it didn't work. Uh, that's not that they didn't try, actually. We mentioned drought resistance. And I don't know, the, the drought guard, Monsanto's drought guard, came out this year. But they found that it was inferior to most, you know, uh, particularly native or even conventional crops in its ability to resist drought. So it, it, they try, and it just doesn't work because there's so many other things going on. We're heating up a little bit, but you should know the floor is dirty, lunch is being served, but I'm happy to go on if our panelists are happy to go on. So, Leslie, and then. I actually have three questions. One is, um, uh, do you have any access to Obama, you know, choosing Monsanto uh, execs on uh, FDA and other organ agencies? And my other question is, um, do you work with Pandana Shiva? And the third is, which six states um, has the label? Uh, first of all, Vandana Shiva is one of my dearest friends. Uh, Navdanya, which is her group, her office is in my office is in D.C. Uh, please, uh, soon you'll see a joint appearance made in Hawaii, Hawaii, uh, which is a, we, did, we, took, we toured the state, and she is a fantastically wonderful friend. Second of all, you should know the Obama administration, in my view, is much worse than the Bush administration when it comes to GMOs and comes to cooperating with Monsanto. Uh, the positions they've taken in court have been extreme. Uh, the uh, invasion of that administration by high officials and by technology industry is more than it was in the prior administration. So I'm not saying in everything, but this particular work has been terrible. Uh, most recently, in the last continuing resolution, Monsanto got a rider in the continuing resolution that says if a court says that a GMO crop is illegally approved and vacates its approval, though the Secretary of Agriculture must give permits to allow that planted to continue, even though the court has said it's illegal and vacated the approval and said it should be planted. Uh, that was uh, passed through uh, uh, Senator Blount of Missouri, uh, and uh, Barbara Mikulski, you know, was head of the chair, she did not let it happen, uh, the Senate side, and uh, they got 250,000, 300,000 comments. The food movement is alive and well in this country. They real one after prior, Mikulski, Blount, and we got a public statement commitment from Senator Mikulski that she does not support it and she's the chair of the committee and she'll never let it go through again. It was a great example of where people do matter, which we were saying you know, that people do matter really show within three days these senators had turned around and said when it comes up in six months, because the writer will, will told them in six months they will not commit 
but it would be devastating. Uh, there's also an amendment to the Farm Bill that says um, that any genetic engineering crop that goes for approval of the USDA after 12 months has to automatically be approved, no matter what. Uh, automatic approval after 12 months. That's an amendment to the Farm Bill. We'll be working with Food and Water Wash, we'll be working with everyone else, Sound uh, uh, Food Safety Well, too, to make sure that that does not happen. We've got some good support against it in the Senate. But you know, Monsanto, uh, you know, they have enormous power. And unfortunately, that power goes to the very top of the administration. In the alfalfa case, for example, the USDA and the Obama administration now taking the position that the USDA does not have the statutory authority to look at contamination, to look at economic harm to farmers, uh, to, to look at harm to organic, which the Bush administration said they needed to do, which is why we won those cases, but they hadn't done it. Now the Obama administration is saying, no, we changed our minds. We don't have to do it at all. We have absolutely no regulatory authority over them whatsoever unless they're like theirs. That's their new theory in court. And it's a Hail Mary pass, but it just shows you the extent. Oh, and by the way, Bill Sachs, chief lawyer, he took directly from DuPont. Because DuPont's corporate counsel moved from DuPont directly into the USDA. And in my 25 years of watching, I've never seen an agency take as its counsel somebody who was directly the corporate counsel of so it, it, is a, uh, it is a very, you know, there's a lot of corruption going on right now, and I wish I could be more positive about the Obama administration. I don't know where Michelle is in her organic garden, but uh, <laughs> it hasn't shown up yet. It's, it's a really trench warfare that we're all involved in. And now with Kathleen Merrigan, many of you know Kathleen, uh, she was the soul of the organic, you know, in, in the USDA, uh, second under Bill Sack. She has resigned under strange circumstances. We believe she was pushed out because uh, they're pushing on organic. Uh, from the USDA. So it's, uh, it's French warfare right now in the second, in the second uh, 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 term. Of the month. We have one more question. Oh, so, say you're into seed we're also looking at the Namashiva. And in fact, if you go to our website and, and log on to our, just our, our, our email list, because what we're doing is working on an initiative that's going to come out in October. So, um, you know, support us. We, we need all the support we can pull together. Six days that pass the labeling bill are no, but no state yet has passed labeling. So, uh, no, that's not true. Alaska has passed, and there's law in Alaska yet to label a genetic engineered fish or any genetic engineered fish product in Alaska. Hawaii did not. Uh, Hawaii, yeah, Hawaii was terrible. So Hawaii, Hawaii uh, has gotten rid of our Taro patents. Uh, and had the university rip them up. Uh, he was already a great activist who so had worked with for many years did that. Uh, and was with me in Papua Nishiba on our tour of Hawaii last month. It was uh, really fantastic. The farmer protection thing, you know, bears me here. I need my staff. Okay, I know it's California, I know it's North Dakota, I know it's South Dakota, I know it's Indiana, and two more. And it's on our website, but those four, those four are the six. small claims court, they can send their legal counsel, and they have to send somebody who's a representative of the company. So could we find an angle where we could have tens of thousands of people in grassroots effort all over the country sue each of these companies one after the other, tie them up, sending their people to have to go to small claims court? I mean, can we come up with an angle? You know, and I can't say too, many, too much about this, but there's this situation that just can happen like that. And it did not, it did not work. Um, the one example I know, people remember Percy Schmeisel, which Schmeisel was this amazing farmer, an old farmer up in Canada. Uh, he did not use the round of crop. He was sued for contamination all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court. Uh, he lost five to four. I was up there, I was doing an argument with the Amici and uh, freezing Ottawa. And, um, but they did say that Monsanto was entitled to no money because there was no value added. But, uh, Percy's wife is Louise, and so she got a scientist to look at her farm garden, and it had been contaminated. So she sued Monsanto in small claims court, and won. I think she won $360, uh, but it made national news all the press Canada. Yeah, and I think it's so much as a, the, the, the settlement, and just making their people, the cost to them as corporations, having to send staff, not legal, not their lawyers. Yeah. 
it's interesting, and we're, we're also trying to encourage, uh, through our road service and safety work, we're trying to encourage farmers to sue for trespass. Now, the only problem with that is sometimes they can sue another farmer, and you know, that's difficult. Uh, we believe that if we can start a whole group of trespass cases, uh, it will create a huge disincentive for people to use uh, things have different laws on trespass, so that's because of an issue with that. That was kind of like when we were with the Farm Protection Act, it's you know, it's our right to farm, and you know, it's personal it's property rights, you know. Is that wrong? Do you have that yet? No, over there, yes. Just, uh, anyone who's interested in signing a petition, we've got a table right around um, on the way out. Okay. And, and we have, we have something right here. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Okay. Thank you to all, thank you to our amazing campers and all their good work. And um, come down and have some lunch and then more fun in the afternoon. Amazing uh, speakers later, too. And thank you, Robin Saino.